Hello there students, I'm Crystal Merdukanes, a clinical instructor teaching fundamentals of nursing practice. So our topic for today is about evidence-based practice and research in nursing. So what is evidence-based practice? So it is also known as evidence-based nursing. So here, nurses integrate best current evidence with clinical expertise and patient or family preferences and values for delivery of optimal health care. So basically, nurses use these evidence-based practices in order to give effective patient care. So of course, they need to consider family or patient preferences and values in rendering those nursing care to their patient. So we also have components of evidence-based practices. So first, we have the clinical expertise. We also have the best evidence. And of course, we have to consider patient safety, or I mean patient values and preferences. So these are the three components of evidence-based practice. So we also have six steps in evidence-based practice. First, is, first step is we need to cultivate a spirit of inquiry. So we should be inquisitive. We should question uh, things. Uh, why should we uh, change a particular procedure? Why uh, do we always have this negative outcome to our patient? So we have to question that one. Because in questioning, we, um, we may be able to look for solutions and answers for that in order to improve our nursing practice. Second is we ask clinical questions. Of course, we need to ask questions that are related to our profession. Since we are nurses and we are working in a healthcare institution or in a healthcare arena, so we have to ask questions clinically. Also, we search for the best evidence. Of course, that is the main goal of your evidence-based practice. You have to search what is best. You have to search the best uh, evidence that is available in, uh, in the situation right now. So we have also, uh, after searching for the best evidence, we have to critically appraise the evidence. Of course, if we already have that best evidence, we should also you should we should uh, critically appraise that evidence. So we should look into the reliability, the effectivity, the validity of that particular best evidence. Then after that, after clinically appraising the evidence, we need to integrate the evidence with clinical expertise family, client, preferences, and values. So after we have come up with that uh, evidence appraised, so now it's for us to uh, consider values of patients and clinical expertise if it is congruent to those components of evidence-based practice. And after that, we have to implement. And after implementing, we need to evaluate the outcomes of the intervention. So, of course, we're talking about evidence-based practice in nursing. So, it is always uh, with research topics. Okay? Remember that your evidence-based practice are being accumulated because of research. We do research because uh, we do research because we need evidence-based practices. Okay, so what is research? Research entails using formal and systematic processes to address problems and answer questions. So, meaning to say, it's a formal and a systematic process. So, there is a right right guru's procedure. It is highly controlled. So meaning, it goes a step-by-step -step process. So there is no particular way of uh, having a shortcut here. You just really have to undergo the process in order to make sure that in every step, it is uh, 
valid and it and the outcome should be valid and reliable so what is nursing research so nursing research it is using research findings to guide decision about client care so here we are using research to guide our decisions about client care okay so meaning to say as a nurse we do not just do our thing as long as we care that's enough no as nurses we really have to have that knowledge about research what is best to our patient what is an effective interve intervention for our patient so as nurses we must think critically and we must be a researcher as well so approaches to nursing research so we have two major approaches so we have a quantitative research and qualitative research so i believe all of you have knowledge on this um, uh, subject matter uh, since uh, most of you have already conducted research way back in your high school uh, high school or senior high school um, as your academic requirement okay so we have the quantitative research and a qualitative research when we say a quantitative research it entails the systematic collection statistical analysis and interpretation of numerical data so characterized by planned and fixed study processes careful attention to extraneous variables or contaminating factors in the study environment and an, obj and an objective and distanced relationship between the researcher and what is being studied so basically when we say quantitative research study we are dealing with statistical analysis and interpretation of numerical data so everything that can be interpreted using your numerical values or numerical data that is your quantitative research okay so I have mentioned here an extraneous variable so let's discuss about extraneous variables so extraneous variables any variables that could influence the study or the results of the study other than the specific variables being studied for their influence so basically when we say extraneous variables it means these are extra variables and these are not needed in the study if ever they will be included in the study this would give a false result to the study so it's very important as a researcher to be mindful and to be vigilant in detecting and uh, eliminating these extraneous variables because it could affect your uh, study or your research we also have logical positivism what is logical positivism logical positivism it is a philosophical perspective in quantitative research which maintains that truth is absolute and that can be discovered by careful measurement so this logical positivism is under the quantitative uh, research because it maintains the truth is absolute and can be discovered by careful measurement so meaning we uh, give data with numerical values so that means if it is if it is presented with numerical values it means it is absolute it cannot be changed it cannot be altered or it cannot be modified it is how it is presented in numerical values so that is why it is under your quantitative data it is fixed it is truth the truth is absolute okay and can be discovered by careful measurement another approach uh, in your nursing research is we have your qualitative research your qualitative research it is the systematic collection and thematic analysis of narrative data so research collects and analyzes words rather than numbers so the difference between your quantitative and qualitative data is is the data that are being collected in your quantitative research you are 
collecting numbers. You are collecting data and presenting it through numerical statistics or numerical values. In your qualitative research study, we are collecting narrative reports, narrations, and words. And we are interpreting it through words. And we present it uh, using a thematic analysis. And this thematic analysis, it is usually worded. Okay? So, so basically, uh, that is the big difference between your quantitative and qualitative study or research. So, the naturalism. So, a philosophical perspective in qualitative research, which means that reality is relative or contextual and constructed by individuals who are experiencing a phenomenon. It is also referred as constructivism. So, in your quantitative research, the philosophical perspective there is logical positivism. However, in your qualitative research, the philosophical perspective that we are using is naturalism. That means the reality is relative, so it can be changed. For example, the experience of people living in the year uh, 1900 to 2000 is different from those people who are who will be living from 2030 to 2040 okay there is a huge difference there is a relative difference between the two groups okay so that is why when we say qualitative study, it means that modification, changes is okay. Changes are okay. This can be, um, this can be accepted in, qualita in qualitative study because it happens naturally and we could not do about it. Okay? The world is changing, so do our research. Okay. We have three distinct qualitative tradition nurses use. First, we have your phenomenolo phenomenology. So it focuses on the lived experiences of the people. Okay. So if you want to study about lived experiences, you will be conducting a study known as phenomenology. We also have ethnography. It focuses on cultural patterns of thoughts and behaviors. We also have your grounded theory. It focuses on social processes. So when we say grounded theory, you are making a theory out of the behaviors or the social processes that we are into now. Okay. So for example, millennials uh, today, you are, it is a social uh, processes, millennial behaviors, millennial values, millennial practices. So it's a social processes. Mm -hmm. So from that, you will create a theory based on those observations, okay? Research process. So what is research process? It is a process in which decisions are made that result in a detailed plan or proposal for a study as well as the actual implementation of the plan. So we have steps in research process. First, we have to formulate the research problem and, uh, and purpose. Second is to determine the study methods, your methodology. Next, you have to collect research data, analyzing research data. The number five, you have communicating research findings. And six is using research findings in practice. Okay, so we'll be discussing each step one by one. So first, we have your formulating the research problem and purpose. So we are using the format PICO, okay, in formulating research problem. So when we say P, we have patient, population, or problem of interest. When we say I, intervention or therapy to consider for the subject of interest. C stands for comparison of interventions such as no treatment. O for outcome of the intervention. Okay, so we also, uh, this format is 
also used using uh, other extensions. For example, if you want to include the study design, you could have PCOD. If you want to uh, include the setting, uh, you could use the PCOS format. For If you want to include the context or the environment, you use the PCO. Then if you want to include the timeline, you use the PCO. So example of your PICO format is Are children raised by obese adoptive parents also at increased obesity risk compared with those who do not have obese adoptive parents between the age 3 and 18? Okay, so this is a in a question form. Okay, so let's uh, have it segment by segment. So our children, that is your P, your patient or your population, raised by obese adoptive parents, raised by, uh, by obese adoptive parents, that is your intervention. So you are considering that those uh, children who are raised by obese adoptive parents, okay? So that is your intervention. Then also at increased obese uh, risk, also at increased obese risk, that is the outcome. Okay, that is the outcome of the format. So you are considering the here, are children, which is your population or your patient, raised by obese adoptive parents, your intervention, also at increased obesity risk, that's the outcome of the intervention, compared with those, P, again, uh, that's a population or patient who do not have obese adaptive patient. So that is comparison. Okay. So you are comparing those children that are raised by obese adaptive parents from those parents that are not obese. Okay. So that's comparison. That's your C. Between the age 3 and 18. So that is your time frame. Okay. So that is how you formulate a research problem. So it should have those essential aspects. There should have the P, there should have I, the C, and the O. So be mindful of that, students, that when making a, uh, that when formulating a research problem, you must be clear with your uh, purpose, okay? Who are your populations? What are your interventions? Uh, the comparison and of course the outcome that you want to achieve or that you want to uh, investigate okay we also have your independent variable when we say independent variable these are presumed cost or of influence on the dependent variables so meaning it is the cost of a particular uh, problem or a particular solution for example so taking into account a an example for example a uh, level of awareness okay again what is the relationship of uh, what is the relationship of academic performance ah, okay let let us have another one what is the relationship of job satisfaction? What is the relationship between job satisfaction and quality of life of staff nurses? For example, there is the we have the uh, level of satisfaction and the quality of life of staff nurses. So the independent variable there is the cost. Okay, so we are trying to look uh, at the cost of that particular statement of the problem. So the cost there is the level uh, is the level of job satisfaction. Okay. So if the level of job satisfaction is increased, so the quality of life of the staff nurses will also be increased. So meaning, the presumed cost is the level of job satisfaction. So that is the presumed cost and that would influence your dependent variable. 
So, obviously, the dependent variable here is the quality of life of staff nurses. Okay? So, independent, the presumed cause, and the outcome or the effect is the dependent variable. So, in this next slide, we will be discussing about dependent variable. So, it is a behavior, a characteristic, or outcome that the researcher wishes to explain or predict. Okay? So, it's very clear in my example that the quality of life is the dependent variable because it is the outcome of the independent variable. So if you have an increased job satisfaction, so you would also have an increased quality of life. So it could influence, it could, affects, it could affect your uh, quality of life. So what is hypothesis? So when we say hypothesis, it is a predictive statement about the relationship between two or more variables. So it's just your uh, prediction. Okay. So I think, for example, so I think that the level of job satisfaction of staff nurses will influence the quality of life. Okay. So you are making a prediction. And this hypothesis is usually made before the actual uh, research, okay? Because this guides the researcher on what to investigate and what to look uh, into in his or her study. So that's your hypothesis. So determining study methods, so also known as your methodology, so how the study is organized, who or what will be the source of information for the study, and data collection, details such as what data will be collected, how data will be collected, and the timing of data collection. Okay, so basically this uh, methodology is your plan, okay, of your study. So how would you conduct your study? So it is a very important aspect in making your research because here uh, you will be able to plan you'll be able to look into a uh, what design what research design is appropriate to your study and what are the steps that you are going to uh, take in order to accomplish this study research design what is research design it refers to the overall structure or blueprint or general layout of the study. So as what I have mentioned, it is basically a plan of your study. So sample, sources of information of a study. So it may be humans, events, behaviors, documents, or biological specimens. So these are your samples. It is where you get information or you get your sources uh, for a particular study. We also have target population, the universe of elements to which the researcher wishes to be able to apply the study findings. So target population uh, simply means that, for example, you're already done with your study. To whom are you going to apply these okay, findings that could probably uh, solve a particular problem or this study could be beneficial for them, okay? We also have your pilot study. One quality control strategy in research. It is a dress rehearsal before the actual study begins and helpful for detecting problems such as instructions or questionnaire items. So, one quality control strategy in research. So, before the actual implementation of your study, Researchers do conduct pilot study just to make sure uh, if there is any problem with regards to the questionnaire, with regards to the uh, methodology, the study design. So pilot study is usually done before the actual study. Okay. Collecting research data. So you're already done with the methodology 
and you have already tested that in a pilot study and you've um, and you could uh, say that there will be no problem in conducting it in the actual uh, research or samples so we are now going to conduct and collect uh, research data so all of the methodological decisions that have been made are implemented so you are now implementing those methodologies those plan those research design so protocols and instructions so when we say protocols or instructions these are strategies that can be used to ensure the consistency and integrity of data collection procedure so in every research we follow a particular protocols and instructions and these protocols and instructions serve as serve as the basis on how we conduct our study okay this also prevents us from uh, from doing something wrong to our in our study so we have to follow protocols and instructions we also have reliability so it refers to the consistency of measure so the question here is what how reliable is your study okay so you have to, we have to test this one we have to look into the reliability of your research so by the use of measures okay is it consistent for example your questionnaire is being tested to a group of fourth year nursing students in a particular school for example school a you've conducted that one okay so then the then another questionnaire uh, i mean the same questionnaire will also be given to uh, the to school b fourth year students of school b okay so the result of those study must be uh, consistent okay that means if they are consistent that means your questionnaire your study instrument is reliable because it yield uh, because it yielded the same and consistent uh, measures or result so when we say validity it means that it refers to the completeness and conceptual accuracy of measurement so how complete is your questionnaire okay how accurate so in order to validate this you have to uh, you need to uh, ask from experts in research to really uh, examine your questionnaire for completeness and accuracy okay another step after collecting the data it's time for analyzing research data so the collected data are organized and analyzed to answer the research question or test the study's hypothesis so uh, you're done with the collection uh, it's time for you to organize and analyze those data that you were that you have collected in uh, in the previous step so we also we have here descriptive statistics Procedures that organize and summarize large volumes of data, including measures of central tendency and measures of variability. So, here we have the measures of central tendency. It provides a single numerical value that denotes uh, the average value of a variable. So, basically, when we say measure of central tendency, you are actually taking the average of a whole population for example you would want to uh, know the academic performance of second year nursing students uh, so you will have to take all their uh, aver uh, their exam their uh, uh, general weighted average after taking their general weighted average you have to compute the average as a whole then after that after computing the average as a whole you can now uh, have 
a clear picture if what is the level of their academic performance by comparing it in a particular standards. For example, we have their excellent, uh, very satisfactory, satisfactory, below satisfactory, and poor. So you could use those um, standard criteria in evaluating the average of the whole uh, second year nursing students. So that is your measure of central tendency. You are taking the average of a whole population of a particular group that the particular group of your study measure of variability so describe how va uh, values uh, for a describe how values for a variable are dispersed or spread out okay so this means that for example in nursing students you could take those uh general weighted average each uh, one by one okay take it one by one so for example you have five students uh, uh, I'm sorry again so for example you will be taking uh, each average of a uh, students okay so you could say that 20% of them belongs to satisfactory result uh, thirty percent of them belongs to excellent. Forty percent of them belongs to uh, very satisfactory. So this means you are not actually taking, you are not interpreting the whole. You are not interpreting the whole uh, class. However, you are actually taking uh, individual scores and interpret them. How many of them uh, belong to a particular classification? So they varies, okay? They varies. So that is measure of variability. It describe how val values for a variable as dispersed and spread out, okay? We also have your inferential statistics. When we say inferential statistic, it allows researcher to test hypothesis about relationship between variables or dif uh, or differences between groups. Useful when a researcher wants to establish the effectiveness of an intervention. So, this is another way of analyzing data. So, we use inferential statistics. So, if your study or if your research wants to uh, know the relationship between variables or the differences between groups, you will be using an inferential statistics. And if you want to establish effectiveness of interventions, you will be using inferential statistics in analyzing your data. So statistically significant means that, that they are not likely to, to have occurred by chance. So when we say statistically significant, meaning if this particular research will be conducted to another group of people, this will also yield the same results. So the result does not happen by chance. It has a consistency and it is reliable and valid. Okay, That means it is statistically significant. So content analysis. The content of narrative materials is being analyzed. So used in qualitative study. So this is where you really analyze each word of uh, each word in a narration, narration, okay? So you have to identify meanings in every word or in every phrase that your patient or your uh, study participant said, okay? That is content analysis. You have to analyze the content of their uh, verbatim or of their statements. So communicating research findings. So after you have analyzed your study and you have come up the final result of your study, it's time for you to communicate your research findings. So when you communicate research problem, it must be made public if they are to become accessible and used to guide practice decisions. Can be communicated through publication in journals or at conferences. Okay, Students, it is very important that when you make research, your goal must be to communicate those research findings to the public that could probably help them and find solutions to an existing problem, okay? So 
don't just make research because it is just a requirement. Make research because you want to solve something. Because you want to improve someone's lives. Okay? That is the essence of making research. We are making research because we want to improve our quality of life. In nursing, we are making nursing research because we want to render a safe and quality nursing care to our patient. Okay? So, again, going back to the communication, communicating research findings, it can be communicated through uh, publication in journals or conferences. So, using research finding and practice. So, actually, uh, if you have done your research and you have already the result, it is not immediately accepted to be used in the practice of nursing or in the practice of a particular profession. It must undergo a series or rigorous evaluation of that research findings in order for that research finding to be classified as evidence-based practice. Okay, So we have three types of evaluation of research findings. We have the scientific evaluation, comparative analysis, and cost-effective analysis. So when we say scientific evaluation, it is a thorough critique of a study for its conceptual for its conceptual and methodological integrity. Okay? Someone who is an expert should critique your study. Okay? Should look into the conceptual framework of your study and the methods that you are using. Was it appropriate? Was it accurate? Okay, so they will be asking questions. They will be critiquing your research findings. So that is your scientific evaluation. When we say comparative analysis, it involves assessing study findings for their implementation potential. So we have three factors considered. First, how the study findings compare to the findings from other study about the problem. Okay, so in your comparative analysis, an expert will compare your the study findings to a similar study which was conducted by another researcher and compare the result if it is if it is consistent okay if there is similarities if the study findings are somehow the same and can be reliable another one is how the study findings will transfer from the research condition to the re, uh, clinical practice condition so this will also be testing if your study findings is applicable to the clinical practice condition okay because not all research findings are applicable in a research in a clinical setting so so the so an expert should look into this are the study findings of this particular researcher applicable if we apply this in a clinical situation in a clinical condition okay so that should be taken into consideration lastly the practical or feasibility uh, consideration is it feasible if we apply this in the clinical setting when we say feasibility is it uh, applicability uh, applicable is it applicable is it practical uh, does our resource or our financial uh, capability uh, can actually uh, compensate if we implement this particular uh, research findings in our clinic clinical setting? Okay, so we have to consider those things when we say feasibility. Okay, another one we also have your cost benefit analysis involves consideration of the potential risk and benefits of both implementing a change based on studies finding and not implementing a change okay again it involves consideration of the potential risk and benefits of both implementing a change based on the studies finding and not implementing a change so here we are actually considering the potential risk as well as the benefits that it could give if we implement 
this particular research finding in a clinical setting. So we also have here research-related roles and responsibilities for nurses. So research consumer and research team member. So we can be a, we can be a research consumer and also we can be a research team member. Okay? When we say research consumer, it means that we need to have that two skills which are fundamental in the, to this role. So first, locating a relevant literature. So we have to look into a reliable literature or a reliable journal, for example. Then after that, we have to critique research reports. Okay? So we do not just accept um, what uh, are written in that particular uh, journal. We have to criticize, we have to scrutinize, we have to critique the research report. If it is effective or if it is reliable or if it is valid. Okay? So we should have the, these two uh, skills as a research consumer. Another one, we have research team member. We can be a research team member. So protecting the rights of the study participants. So our responsibility is to actually protect the rights of our study participants. So examples are right not to be harmed. Okay, remember that your study participants should not be harmed while during the duration during the duration of your uh, study or your research right to full disclosure you really have to disclose uh, important information that you think uh, the participants should know and right to self-determination okay very important to ask for the consent of the uh, of the participant Okay. If ever he or she will uh, withdraw uh, in the middle of your study, so let him or her. It's his or her right. Uh, it's, it's her right or it's his or her right to self-determination. Of course, right to privacy. If the patient or if the participant uh, doesn't want to reveal his or her identity, so you should respect those. Okay, you need to uh, put initials, for example, not just uh, so that uh, his or her identity will not be revealed. Okay. Also, confidentiality. So, confidentiality means that any information a participant relates will not be made public or available to others without the participant's consent. Okay. So before. You can, uh, before you ask information from your patient, you have to really uh, disclose this matter. That if the patient wants to, uh, this, uh, if the patient wants to conceal uh, his or her identity or the information that he will be given to the public. So you have to follow uh, what the participant wants uh, for his or her information okay you really have to ask the patient or the participants if he or she wants to reveal this to the public or just keep it okay that's confidentiality it is very important to really maintain the confidentiality all throughout the uh, the research okay it's very important 